Yeah. His head's going to fall off. Chilling out. Chilling. <laughs> Very easy to chill out in uh, UK this time of the year. But when you get to Australia, then you'll be sweltering. But anyway, so uh, it's very easy to um, tell you to relax and don't be afraid of relaxation. Don't be afraid of just waiting and being patient. There is the moment we're still, still waiting for Jake to come in, but this is very usual in life. He's here. Okay. I've already started this little story, so now you have to wait. <laughs> but we have what's called the in-between moments of life. Because I notice that many of my times you're going from one appointment to another, uh, one talk to another, one retreat to another, one country to another, and you have all these wonderful moments where you've left one place and you haven't arrived at the other place. It's a train station, it's waiting for your lift, it's just uh, waiting for the lunch to be served. You call those the in-between moments of life. And if you count all the in-between moments of life, there's probably more of those than there's anything else. When you've left one place and you haven't arrived at the other place, you're in between. And those are wonderful places to actually to get wisdom, insight and peace. You don't have to be somewhere. Arrived at the meditation retreat center, arrived back home, wherever that home happens to be, you find all of life really, or at least most of it, is the in-between moments. So that's one of the reasons why that if you're here, don't go home yet. In other words, your body may be here, but your mind is already back, wondering what you're going to have for dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and you're missing out so much on life. So, sometimes that it is, it is the journey is important, not the goal, not reaching the place, but how you got there. The wisdom, the peace, the friendship, the love, and all you learnt on the way. So this particular retreat taught a lot about sort of jhanas and kindness, with a lot of jokes. It doesn't really matter to me how far you've gone into the mind and how close you've got to jhanas or to enlightenment. It's actually how you practice these last few days. Because that in between moments, the way that you live, the way that you smile, the way that you are kind, the way that you can take yourself not so seriously and crack a joke every now and again, those are most important because those are what tell me that you have the, the <coughs> equipment, you have the guide in order to carry on by yourself when you leave this place. It's not the attainments, but it's how you, your attitude towards practice, towards life, and hopefully that has been refined in such a way that whether it's learning how to meditate, whether it's navigating the various difficulties of life, whether it's you know, managing family and friends, difficulties and successes, every one of those is no different and how you manage your spiritual path. There should be no distinction. This is what I do at home, or in business, or in monastery, and this is what I do when I sit down to meditate. It's not what you are observing, it's how you are observing it. So anyway, just a couple of points there, but now uh, we're supposed to have um, something up from uh, Jack. Jake. Okay. Here we go. Da da da. So you've got your jokes already? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Has someone really won it? No. Uh, that's 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 okay. Yeah. Uh, wow. A, a, a little bit of a hard act to follow, actually. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. 
but uh, I'll just keep, keep this very simple. Um, first off, uh, just on behalf of everyone, I think I'd like to extend a big, big thank you to Ajahn Brahm for, uh, for all the teachings, all the kindness, coming all this way to, uh, to, to lead this retreat for us, and also Venerable Chandler for making this retreat possible. And also, um, lots of people who, um, who volunteer their time and their energy uh, to make Boom. the Anukampa Bikuni project possible. Uh, Sue, thank you for, uh, for uh, managing the retreat. Uh, and um, I, I don't, is there anyone else in this room who, who is a kind of a... Yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, trusty. Lots, lots of people in this room who, uh, who make these retreats possible, make the, you know, the website possible, the, you know, the, uh, uh, manage the finances, the bookings, everything is done uh, completely voluntarily. It's all freely given uh, time and, and energy, and, and that's, uh, that's a really inspiring thing. And uh, just as it's incredibly inspiring that, uh, and, you know, ever since the time of uh, the Buddha, uh, you know, great nuns and monks uh, have, uh, <laughs> have uh, shared these, these teachings um, you know, entirely freely, just out of compassion, kindness, and generosity. Uh, we also have this opportunity to, to support this, uh, this uh, tradition, this c continuing tradition, um, which, uh, you know, which we're envis envisaging as a, as a Bikuni monastery here, here in the UK. Uh, and, and along that way, we, you know, there's, there's uh, hope maybe there's going to be other retreats and, and events of various kinds. Uh, and so we all have an opportunity to, to be part of this incredible, uh, you know, long tradition, uh, going back to the time of the Buddha. So, um, just wanted to mention that uh, previous retreats uh, through Anakampa uh, have, have been um, very generously supported by uh, a Bodhinyana group in uh, Singapore, uh, which meant that uh, uh, all the money that, um, that people on the retreats um, uh, paid was, w w was able to go straight to, to Anukampa project itself to, to support the, uh, the monastery and uh, future events. Um, this time though, uh, uh, all, all the, the, the bookings money has, has, has gone just towards the, the food and the, and the lodgings for uh, for, for this retreat, um, which means that uh, um, still there is, you know, there is uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, to to give uh, towards the kind of the future, you know, the continuation of, of, of this project. Uh, there's a, there's a very exciting development already, which we mentioned at the start. There's uh, it's going to be this uh, house in Oxford, a residence for um, for Venerable Chanda and. Uh, a place where uh, a couple of people um, will also, lay people perhaps, will also be able to, to stay and to uh, practice and share the Dhamma. Um, so uh, anything that you, could, you can give today uh, will um, help towards uh, to maintaining that uh, Bikuni residence for, um, for the six month period uh, whilst uh, Venerable Chandra is kind of establishing further support uh, for, for, the, uh, uh, for the monastery. Uh, and of course, you know, it's also uh, a anything given is also in support of, of the, uh, the future monastery itself. Um, so there is a there is a, a bucket out there with uh, where, where donations ca can be made. Um, if uh, if a little bit of time is necessary to reflect, consider, uh, you know, what uh, what we can give, what we'd like to give, then it's also I think possible to. Uh, go home and go online later and, uh, and, and, and make donations. I think there's also the merchandise available, is that right? Some books. There's some books. As, uh, have they been offered by somebody? Mm. Anyway, yeah, so someone's offered, a, offered books by Ajahn Brahm, you know, purchasing those. Uh, mm -hmm. That's going to be a uh, help for, for the Anacampa project, and, and I think um, there's other bits of merchandise as well. Uh, there's also gift aid forms, so Anyone paying a taxi here, here in the UK means that uh, they can um, uh, extend the opportunity for making good karma to the Treasury Department. Uh, <laughs> 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 
since I'm a company a charity, the, uh, the, the treasury will chip in a little bit for, for, you know, for anything that's, that's given with, with gift aid. So that's, that's a great way of, quite, great way of uh, sharing merit with, uh, with the government. Um, so um, <coughs> please, please consider that. Consider that. And, uh, and uh, just before I wrap up, there's uh, one other uh, what possible way that uh, uh, someone might be able to, to help um, an temple project. Uh, that is the the, uh, the mats that we've all been <laughs> sitting on. Uh, they need a home for a little while, um, preferably in the uh, within London or in the vicinity of London or, or some or, or Oxford, somewhere in between. Uh, if anyone here is uh, is uh, living in one of those places, driving back there, has space in their vehicle, um, um, maybe you could come and speak to to, to one of us later. Um, uh, or you know, perhaps even if not, perhaps spread the word um, because uh, we, we need somewhere uh, these these mats can be taken back today uh, and stored for a little while. Is that, is that what I said? Oh yeah, what's happening over there? We can big fit So what? Using voices now? I think it's going to be silent. We're going to be silent. Yeah. Okay. It's not silent anyway. I don't know what you're getting from his role for the auctioneer. The auctioneer role. Yeah. Has it? Uh, Anyone put any silent bids in yet on a piece of paper? I think so. Wow, that poor teddy bear <laughs> is going to feel rejected <laughs> and unloved. <laughs> Nobody wants that teddy bear. But that teddy bear is, I don't know where you found uh, the. Oh, I've got. Wee! <laughs> Another one. And, okay. Uh, remember that. Um, Teddy bears are very important. That was the only, how many people have seen TED Talks? <laughs> That's where it's gone from. The TED Channel. Uh, and sometimes it brings back happy memories of. So, what do you think, uh, Teddy Bear? I think that I'm a very blessed Teddy Bear because I've been sitting on the laps of. <laughs> Uh, Vikuni and Riku. So I'm a very holy bear. <laughs> I tried, did that work? Or should I stick to my job as a mug and not as a ventriloquist? <laughs> but sometimes it's for a good cause, and sometimes it's a cuddly bear. It's really nice. And actually, the, why not? Because uh, tomorrow I'll be going to warmer crimes. I will. Throw in my hat <laughs> as an extra, extra because I'll be okay for one day. It'll be as an extra bonus free gift. <laughs> <laughs> and this hat has been on my holy head. Soak <laughs> up the power. <laughs> and this. So anyone who hasn't had a good meditation yet, <laughs> it's just like Harry. Did Harry Potter have a, a cap or a hat on? A witch's hat or something. Did he? But anyway, this is a monk's hat. They go for a lot in Singapore. Oh yeah, about five thousand dollars it went for. US <laughs> a lot. And so especially we cut price because the pound is going down. <laughs> <laughs> but the hat is going up. So it's a good investment too. Because sometimes people invest in houses, they invest in shares. They invest in companies which go broke, but a holy hat gets more and more valuable as the years go by. Just like they have in the British Museum, just these old, no, not British Museum, in the Victorian Albert, these old masterpieces. And this becomes a master hat, a cap of power, a hat of peace. <laughs> so you just put the hat on and straight away the energy of silence and kindness just soaks <coughs> into you. There's many things people want to uh, auction off for, for um, oh. um, well, you know it's coming up, don't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because the only thing left, which was really close to me, which I've used for the last 35 years, 
is my toilet seat. And I've got very, very good uh, digestion, which means it's a holy toilet seat. So if anyone has any problems, I thought we should auction that. Just sit on it and all your <coughs> indigestion, constipation, diarrhea will be blessed. The people didn't actually see that was relevant. But anyway, the hats. I wasn't thinking of that. Well, you <coughs> I was thinking of the back scraper. The back? Scraper. You've forgotten. Yeah, I've forgotten that anyway. But anyway, <laughs> this is a very holy hat. But it's only not just a teddy bear and a hat. It's also it's a nice reason just to, to be generous and give. I did this myself many, 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 many times, even just coming here. I don't have to come here. I've got enough business over, and we've got enough monasteries to look after. But it needs to be done. And, you know, I did ask uh, Venerable Chanda, you know, to uh, please, if you, have, if you can build a Bikini monastery. It's not coming from here, it's coming from me. So I want this to happen. And she's kindly, she doesn't need to do all this work. She was telling me she could stay in a nice place like Burma or even in Perth and just have a nice peaceful life. This is a sacrifice, it's what a monk or a nun could do to give to something which is much better. So if anyone, if you want to support the monasteries, especially the Bikini monasteries, there isn't any Bikini monastery in England. There's monasteries for, uh, for what do they call them, 10 precept nuns? But you know, to me that's not really enough. I don't want to sort of have some equity. So, uh, any bids for uh, the teddy bear and have naming rights as well. Because I think I read even in Australia, you had a ferry and you, you asked the public to actually to name it and it became, was it something like ferry face or something? Boat McBoat face. Boat McBoat face. Boat face. So you could call this one <laughs> Teddy McTeddy <laughs> Bad face. <laughs> or Blah McBoat face. <laughs> okay, whatever. Anyway, the name of rights are yours. So we've got a few over here. When I was a student, <coughs> there was a Tibetan nun came and she gave a talk. And it was one talk which I remember that I didn't go to sleep on. It wasn't just you know, telling about Dhamma, which I could read in the book. No, it was just she was practicing Dhamma. She was over in Sikkim somewhere <coughs> looking after an orphanage for just homeless girls. And when I sort of heard that, I went to my, <coughs> to my back the next morning. And I got a, I got the details from her. And it's only twenty pound, a twenty pound, twenty pound bag check, whatever that was. Uh, in, I forget what the Sikkim uh, currency was, but anyway, I gave it to them right next morning, and that was two weeks' food money for me. So I went hungry. I still got something to eat, but not much. But that was some of the best money I've ever spent. Couldn't afford it. But I couldn't afford not to, because it's an important course. I felt so good about that afterwards. So, if you can do it, don't have to do it now, do it anonymously later on. We've got a few. One, two, three. Go and take a bet. Yeah, I did, indeed, yeah. Oh, well done. Um, maybe I'll, I'll make a, uh, uh, a fundraising so I don't bother to get a pen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, might be even better, yes. Okay, so we, well, I will give the, the talk now, then the better meditation. Okay. And doing the better meditation, who knows? Some more. <laughs> <laughs> Comes in. And if anybody, have we got anyone got an iPhone here or anything? Because you can get um, bids from overseas. <laughs> Anonymous bids. We'd have to be live. Uh, uh, live? Yeah, we'd have to be live streamed. Live stream. Oh no, just that. okay. No, people actually they do they do get on the phone to their friends and say, look, there's a very very uh, expensive teddy bear going really really cheap. Do you want to make a bid for it? There's many many. I have a question. What? Um, I'm very concerned. You have enough hats to keep your head. <coughs> because I'm only one less than a day, and then I'm taking a flight over to Penang. Only one day and I've got lots of... You know what happens? This is serious, not joking. That if you do something really, really good and kindness and sacrifice and giving, somehow or other you don't get cold. 
But there's something that you you dwell on the kindness and the generosity, the, the really wonderful things which you've done. I won't get cold. Because every time if I feel a bit of a chill, I feel, ah, oh, I give my hat to somebody to give us an inspiration. And get another hat. So how often can you get inspiration? So that's why I don't mind giving my hat away. Just so that, you know, the you know, Bikini Chanda, she should have been in, in bed getting over her cold, but you know, she came up here just to carry on, just to help, to serve. And that's a wonderful thing. So we all sort of serve and sacrifice in our own way. So anyway, so later on, all of those of you who are, uh, well, just women, men, <coughs> when someone said, why don't we build a retreat centre in the nuns' monastery? You know, one thing first, but why not in the future? So the next time you can have a retreat centre where you don't see crosses on the wall, you don't you know, see... Some people actually, they, they find that very difficult. But you know, some people find it wonderful because you know, it's really just we work together. And sometimes it can be very effective like that. Is that the story of that, that child? He's really, really naughty and lazy. And he was always failing his mass O level. And then his father tried to get him uh, out of school, tutoring, <coughs> changed schools, this school and that school, and nothing worked. He kept failing his O level maths. Eventually, he took him to a, a Catholic school. And as soon as he went to a Catholic school, that he passed. You know, really did well. He said, Why was it, what's with a Catholic school that they, uh, you did very well in maths? It wasn't a standard of teaching or whatever. He said, No, no, it wasn't anything to do with that. As soon as I went in to the lobby of the school and I saw this boy nailed to the plus sign, <laughs> I realised I was serious about that. <laughs> I do have to kind of <laughs> Okay. I've never heard that one before. But anyway, so uh, we can... Um, uh, I'll be fine. So anyway, uh, I'm always, I'm pretty hot-headed anyway, so. <laughs> anyway, so, um, again, the whole purpose of um, uh, being together is serving and looking after one another. And, you know, it's the way to deep and deep meditation is very hard to let go. Something bigger, something better. So when we do let go of our wants, our desires, you find that everything you really need comes to you. Strange. But every time we chase things, we always miss out on life. When we want something more, we can't enjoy what we already have. So I don't know what you want right now, but let it go. And enjoy <coughs> what you have right now. Peace, rest, kindness, being accepted, being part of things. And <coughs> being part of a little community. And I do hope that you, you do keep in touch with one another, a little community of Kalyana Mitters, if you want to, that is. And it also means that uh, after the retreat is finished, uh, you all go to different parts of England, uh, uh, Europe. Who else, is, who else is from outside of Europe, other than me? No. Oh yeah, you're from Sri Lanka. And from Canada. Canada. Okay, what part? Montreal. Montreal. Oh, great. I'll be, I'll be there in June. You'd go to what? Going to um, uh, Toronto, but sometimes to Montreal as well. Might see you over there. The world is a small place. Uh, and so keep in touch because it is a community. You've gone through. Um, all of these last eight or nine days together. Sometimes you've shared many things together, including colds, <laughs> laughter, groaning, and you've been next, to what, next door to one another uh, in your rooms, or maybe in the same room, snoring, banging doors, <laughs> next to each other when you are um, eating. 
So there is a sort of a, a camaraderie, a bonding, which actually happens even in silence. You see one another, smile at one another, and you feel to sometimes, you know, if it's possible, actually to keep in touch with one another. That's fine. And it's also that sometimes we do stuff which irritates us or sort of upsets us. So as part of this um, closing part of the retreat, it's nice to do what we call a forgiveness ceremony. It's a very beautiful way of ending things. So, <coughs> if you want to just uh, close your eyes, you don't have to be in a meditation posture. <coughs> Close your eyes. And you think just like me, just like them. We're in this journey of samsara together. And when we are close to one another, when we are travelling together, there will always be things which can irritate us. So, now I'm going to say, and I want you to see if you can uh, follow in with me with thought. That whatever I may have done, by body, by speech, or by mind, either intentional or on purpose, I'm a human, sometimes I do things out of spite, shouldn't do, but this is reality. <coughs> or things which I did, said, or thought, just by accident, didn't mean to harm anybody. Any of these things which may have hurt any of us, or have made life a little bit more difficult, I'm sorry. I ask forgiveness. Or anything which I didn't do, which I should have done which has hurt or harmed you. Please, I'm sorry. As I ask forgiveness, and I give forgiveness, understanding in life that each one of us can bump into things, can hurt, and maybe all we need is to have acknowledgement that hurt me. You say sorry. And that changes the whole atmosphere of living together. So, having asked forgiveness, please give forgiveness. Acknowledging that we are imperfect beings. We come with our karma. But what I have found, even in very serious offenders in prison, we all have a good heart deep inside. The jewel in the heart of the lotus is beautiful. <coughs> I just give you some encouragement to not keep thinking about the two bad bricks. For the nine billion, <coughs> 998 million, so 999 million, 999,000, 999.99998 <laughs> bad bricks. They're there. And you encourage them, the good bricks, to come forth. So please, as you think of all the people you've shared this week with, if they've hurt you, forgive them. And if you've hurt others, please accept their forgiveness. So only the good bricks you will take from this retreat. The bad ones, you just let disappear in the past, taking no bad feelings, bad thoughts with you on the journey out of this place into your next <coughs> venue. So now you can open your eyes. When everyone does forgiveness to me, or I do forgiveness to them, it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. 
The one who's right is the one who asks forgiveness. It doesn't matter judging, because it's a beautiful ceremony, a beautiful way of uh, acknowledging our imperfections, but looking beyond those to something greater. So the kindness, forgiveness, and the warmth we have, sharing, even just eight days together. But when we leave, we feel this wonderful sense of goodness we take away, not the badness, no bad memories. <coughs> even that little lady who just uh, I was you know, getting a bit disturbed in the meditation, she gives forgiveness, asks forgiveness, you give forgiveness. And we carry nothing back in the past and to the future, sorry. So anyway, <coughs> that is a little forgiveness ceremony and uh, it's usually, I think it goes on seamlessly, I never keep schedules very well, it's a little bit early, but it's nevertheless, I think it's a good time to just uh, go straight into the loving-kindness meditation. So, at the same time, I'll give ten a little bit more boost of energy. It's not a TED talk, this is a, a TED med. <laughs> TED meditation. Come on, please stop and talk. After all the instruction I've given you, well, I forgive you. Again. <laughs> so just sit down. Chair. So. And bring our attention, our awareness, to our body again. If we're going to do a loving kindness meditation, and we forget from the very beginning about the comfort of our own body, we're just hypocrites. We don't know what kindness really is. So first of all, with your body. Crossing your legs, or letting them dangle over the, the seat. <coughs> They are dangling over a seat. Maybe sometimes you push them forward a bit. Does that make you more comfortable? Or tuck them in. What's the best position? Because what you're saying to your legs, I really care for you. I don't just say that, I mean it. So I'm going to observe and find the best position for you. Sometimes it's like tucking in a child at night time, reading them a story. Tuck them in, stroke their hair. Just to know that they're safe, they're loved and cared for. And that's what I do to my legs. Caring for them. And then my butt. Wiggling it on the chair, on the cushion. It is really comfortable, just like a teddy bear getting its butt just in the right place. My bag is only half an hour meditation, so just feel it reasonably comfortable. But still, I'm aware of it. I can feel it. It's the whole center of my attention now, just my back. And all the feelings and sensations, especially the one which tells me this is comfortable, this is going to be able to be sustained. I really am showing kindness, compassion, <coughs> looking after my back. It's going to last me many more years. So I'm going to be kind to it. aren't in this usual posture. One is holding the microphone, the other isn't. It's holding a bear. It's nice, it's kind. My hand is very happy just to be stroking the fur. Artificial, but it's good enough. Like a bear. My neck, 
a bit irritated, but it's just been overused. We're talking and laughing as well. That doesn't help. <coughs> but I can't resist. <coughs> so the old saying goes, if you haven't heard it, it's not the cough that carries you off. It's the coughing they carry you off. <laughs> you heard that one before. <coughs> so I'm kind to my throat, that's what I'm supposed to do. They just get irritated sometimes. Uh, I'll look after you later. I go after my head. <coughs> Saying to my head, head, you know it's okay if you can sneeze or cough. <coughs> All those coughs, which I have coughed in the last eight days, just when you are about to get into jhanas. Please forgive me. Sneeze, nose, eyes. I care for you. And if you really imagine caring for parts of your body, then relax. You feel good. And a lot of feeling happens too. And I go into my two inches behind my eyes, right between my ears, my brain. Oh brain, having to give talks, having to do other things when I'm in my room, doing emails and stuff and business with Perth. So much stuff. It's okay. A little bit of care means I'll give you a rest. My brain. Be at peace. My whole body cared for. Feel the delight of rest. My mind, you don't have to achieve anything, mind. Just when you want something more, you can't enjoy what you already have. The mind can be free, free to be as you are. You fall asleep, fine, just nature. If you think stupid thoughts, fine, that's just nature. So I'll just let you be, mind. Be kind to me, I'm oh, kind to you, my best friend. And then to start the loving kindness meditation. I usually, to really get into it, I visualize. <coughs> I visualize a little animal usually who is vulnerable, who is hurting, who is in pain. Abandoned, cold, unloved. For me, I usually find that easier with little kittens. But you don't have to use a kitten, it can be a puppy, a baby, <coughs> a little rabbit, or a, a fluffy teddy bear. Or even like a plant. A little plant in a pot in the balcony of your London apartment. Whatever it is. Something which really does need your protection and kindness. And I imagine that it'll be. So when I say kitten, you can interpret that as meaning a little baby. A <coughs> even like a lonely deceased friend. Or someone who is in an old people's home somewhere. No one's ever visits them. So many people who need you, who need your kindness. I imagine one. This mighty little kid. I imagine this little kid and another stray, abandoned kid. 
just walking somewhere and see if the little eyes poking out from the darkness <coughs> from some cold little corner of our land. You see his little eyes, it's obviously in pain, hungry, terribly alone. And every time it's ventured out from its little dark corner, it's been scratched or bitten. This trust has only been rewarded by pain and more rejection. That's such a harsh life. But still it has a tiny bit of trust and hope left. And this big fat mark comes past. And looks at that little kid. And my heart melts. But I know I can't just reach my hand in. It's too scared and terrified. So I get the eye contact. My eyes with that little imaginary kid. So afraid, so timid. For good reason. With my eyes to its eyes, I say, little kid, the door of my heart is wide open for you. I will never harm or hurt you. I will never treat you with, <coughs> with violence. I just only want to feed you, to keep you safe, to keep you warm, so your wounds can heal. You can realise there are lots of wonderful people in this world who do look after one another, who do care, who go out their way to help their little kid. Let me love you and care for you and protect you. And just saying those words, keeping eye contact, it's as if the kid could understand my words. You can see in his eyes. They somehow tell me that he's not so afraid. He's still very, very anxious. I feel it's a time I can extend my hand. Very slowly, no jerky movements. Extend my hand closer and closer. This little bag of bones and fur. And as I get closer, it withdraws a little bit, but not that much. It allows me to touch her. To touch her skin so gently, the smallest jerk or pain than that little kid would lose its tiny bit of trust. So I move very slowly, very softly. And I'm shocked. I can feel the dried blood on his skin. The bones with hardly any any flesh between them. The fur dirty, matted. That poor kitten has been through hell. <coughs> and I touch it gently as I possibly can. And as I touch it, I lift it. There's no way it's so thin, malnourished. It allows me to lift it, dig it out of the corner. It's actually, I'm not abusing or hurting it or biting it or scratching it. Maybe the first being is met in its short life who she could trust. The little kitten needs someone who can protect it, feed it, and give it a home. And that's me. Thank you, kitten, for giving me that privilege. And I bring it up <coughs> to my chest. <coughs> See its eyes beginning to soften with hope. 
perhaps there is someone who will not hurt it. And I just cuddle it in my chest, always really, really softly, because some of those wounds must still hurt. And I just cuddle it. When I'm cuddling it, I feel just above my heart region, in my chest, a little tingle start to develop. It's the physical counterpart to love and care and compassion. I don't distinguish which one is which. Kindness, compassion, com care. <coughs> I just generate this beautiful golden light from my, from my heart region. It just goes through my chest and into that little kitty. Going right inside of it and healing, relaxing, taking away the tightness, the pain, the fear. As I feel this little kitten receive my love, receive, receive my warmth, it relaxes. It still needs so much love for the future, so much food and safety and sleep and kindness. It has such a, a very lot of suffering in its short life. <coughs> now it's got to get used to care. And I'm so surprised I see this little kitten's eyes close. They start to purr, maybe for the first time in its life. Somehow it knows it's got a protector, a friend some big human who can keep it safe from these other big animals, jealous, attacking, bullying. I'm his protector and I really mean it, I commit to making sure my little kitten is safe, fed. Dear little kitten, the door of my heart is open to you. You can come in and go whenever you want. I don't want to try and control you or own you. I want to be a friend to you. To enjoy each other's company at the right time. But for now, just to strengthen you, clean you, get your energies up again, gives you faith in the kindness of others the ones again. <coughs> it just goes to sleep in my arms. Trust in me so much. I will never let you down. I will never break that trust. And as that loving kindness, it spreads that little kitten more and more. The tingle in my chest gets stronger. It's a joy. It's a, a great bliss to be able to give unconditional love. It's a joy to give protect, careful. You don't need anything back. Getting something back will just spoil the unconditionality of the loving kindness and care. At the right time, when the loving kindness is strong enough, <coughs> and only you can know that, then I just as it were, put the cat down, safe. And then I visualize another person, this time a real person. This could be the closest person to you in this world. Someone you really deeply love and care for. And they may look like they're strong and independent, but they're not. Each one of us needs kindness, the warmth, the help of others. So look at my best friend. Where do they have to be in this world? Look at them and see the similarities they have to a vulnerable little kid. Maybe not apparent at first, but you know each one of us has been bitten and hurt and misunderstood. 
sometimes losing our faith in the world, losing our hope, we never find any kindness. In moments like that we have this other little kid has nearly every day of its life up to now. The little friend of yours, the one you turn your most with in this life. Look at them. They're my friend, my companion, my close associate. I care for you. Your happiness is important to me. That your happiness is my happiness too. When you hurt, when you cry, I cry as well. It's not just for me. May you, my best friend, feel safe. May you feel peace. My best friend, may you feel the happiness of never wanting anything for yourself. Just be happy what you have. And have the, the great opportunity just to care. <coughs> My closest friend in this life. Sometimes I may not say this enough. But I really respect you. You're not perfect, but then, not, same with me, I'm not either. That's why we need one another. My dearest friend, may you be well and happy. In your own way. May you be at peace. When you're sick, please know that I'm there. Maybe, or maybe in the other side of the world. But my thoughts, my mind, will send you every ounce of energy which I have. I care for you. And imagine this beautiful golden light of loving kindness. Visualizing it like a big golden emitter in your heart, streaming out to your best friend, your partner. Dreaming out to them, bathing them from head to toe. Just like sapping them with a golden light. Never think they don't deserve it. They may not be perfect, but they need it. And you need to give, which is more important. And as you zap them with this beautiful loving kindness, right in their chest, right through their inner organs. They may have all sorts of diseases and pains. Use that. Though. It's amazing just how kindness relaxes, opens up channels which are blocked, allowing healing to enter, <coughs> giving hope when there's desperation, giving joy when sometimes we think there's no way out, there's pain in each way, it gives joy and hope. And I'm happy that someone actually cares. And it goes right up inside of you. <coughs> Your best friend, partner, lover. Right inside. Right up to their head. Right through their ears right up to their sinuses and down their nose, in their sort of legs, right to every inch of their body. And the more you give them, the more you give this unconditional loving kindness, the more you find this unlimited, this upper mana, it's boundless. The more you give, the more you have. It is that your best friend up and down, in and out, sapping them with beautiful loving kindness. And then pause to feel how it is in your chest. That getting stronger, stronger, stronger. And then, without opening your eyes, imagine all the people in this room people you've shared the last eight days with. 
You'd be surprised at how similar they are to you. You may have thought, ah, they've been sitting up there, just getting up early, going to bed late, they must have wonderful meditation. But each in their own way we struggle. Each in their own way we face disappointment and obstacles. So, all the people in this room, the door of my heart is open to you. I care for you. Everyone, even people you don't know their names, never been introduced, just see them coming and going. They are like you. So you say to them, may you be at peace, healthy, may you be free, may you enjoy this incredible bliss, which is not asking anything, doesn't need anything, just gives. May you be happy and well. May you be in line before me. May you get uh, any dollars I have, I give them to you. You have them. We should give everything to all the beings in this room, sharing this beautiful golden light of loving kindness goes into every being in this room, around inside, up and down, until it just bathes this whole room in the golden light of unconditional, unbounded loving kindness. So sometimes it's hard to distinguish <coughs> between you and everyone else. <coughs> so, soon that golden light of loving kindness is incredibly strong too big, powerful for this room. It goes out, out through the windows, the doors, the ceiling, to all the cooks and cleaners and staff. Or even this moment, making sure we get a good feed before we leave. May all of you be happy and well. You may not even be Buddhist, I don't know what you are, but it doesn't matter. We care for you. We hope you picked up some of this energy of kindness, non judgmental love, friendliness. We've been our cooks, our cleaners. Thank you so much. Without you, we wouldn't have been able to meditate so well. <coughs> As it goes out even further, out into the neighborhood the cold countryside and into little holes where the rabbits and the foxes and the hedgehogs and the badgers where they are sleeping now a wonderful sleep little badgers the little babies the birds in the sky we're now visiting some warm place in the tree may all be well and happy out into the roads, the motorways and the cities. As you're, imagine your golden light of loving kindness, being unrestrained, unlimited, spreading further and further as it goes to different parts of England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland. It covers some of the people you know friends, relations, work colleagues. They may not know who you're thinking about them now, but you are. The people grieving, the wives who passed away, who are afraid <coughs> that some terrible disaster will happen to them. People who are anxious, depressed. People who are young kids who are being bullied. All these people who think they're so alone, you're not. The animals, birds, they're all beings, politicians, doctors, 
There will be in this land. Receive my loving kindness. This golden glow spreads over the whole country. Take away the chill of winter, giving the warmth of friendship, of kindness, <coughs> even from people you don't even know. This loving kindness, this golden glow, could be no further. However, the, the seas, to Europe, to Canada, Montreal, the United States, to all beings, the people desperate for safety, for food, animals afraid, terrified, birds in the air, fish in the sea. I send it all the way over to Asia, south to Australia, New Zealand. So many of my friends wondering where my, when I'm going to come back. Soon. And soon. It's soon here. May all beings in this world, including the life in the air, the health of the land, the harmony in the seas. Sometimes we hurt this planet Earth so much. Just caring for her, wishing her well. The little kid, sometimes so exploited, now we care. This beautiful loving kindness going over this whole globe with all the plants, all of the fauna, all of the coal in the ocean, all of the invisible energy in the air, all beings, all life, may you all be happy and well. The more you give, the more energy and happiness and joy you have in your heart. Just go back to your heart and see how it feels. You just pause there for a while, including all beings without exception, wishing them happiness and well-being. And they all need it. And then, if you haven't realized already, there's one being you left out. One being you missed. That's the being you say goodnight to when you go to sleep. The last being you see. The first being you become aware of when you wake up in the morning. This being which bears your own name. Me. So you take that energy and you put some of it on you. As if you imagine you're standing in front of a full-length mirror, striving, afraid sometimes, hurt by other speech, or hurt because they ignore you. They think you're not very important. But you know you're important. You give yourself that kindness. May I, this person I'm imagining seeing, in this mirror, me. May I be free of all tightness and tension. May I let go of fear. May I be well, physically, and mentally, and emotionally. I care for me. And I'm so busy giving kindness to others helping others, looking after others, doing my duties to others. In these moments I remember the duties to me. Body, may you relax, take a break, care for yourself. Mind, don't be so judgmental, I'm good enough. As you care for yourself, it gives this wonderful love 
this kindness, this golden energy inside your own body, way up to the head, in your nose, for me, my throat, which is itchy, down to your tummy, your hands, shoulders, arms, bathing yourself in your own golden light of kindness to your feet, knees. You don't resist. You don't think there must be something wrong when I'm loving myself. You deserve it. You're a being just like any other. You should give yourself kindness, forgiveness. If anything I have done to me, my body, speech, or mind, should have been a bit too harsh. Asking too much of me. Forgive me. Would you give forgiveness to yourself? You come to peace with yourself. Embrace yourself. The door of my heart is open to all of me. Come in. This golden light finds its way home. I'm just going to pause there. Would you enjoy unconditional love to everybody as to you? Please keep your eyes closed as I give a traditional Buddhist blessing in Pali. each other again. Some place, somewhere. And you can't get rid of me that easy. <laughs> okay. Very good. Just a day. Cough, whatever. And uh, just before we go off and do whatever, it's time just to say those few words about and a couple, wasn't it? Okay, I'll take that a lot. You know what other company means to me? Passion, feeling along with it. Another lovely word. Feeling that there is something we can give, I can give, Buddhism can give, meditation can give for our world. A bit of kindness, a bit of companionship, a bit of non judgmental, looking after everybody. And I uh, hope you understand that, or at least LGBTQIE, QI. We'll get off the end. But honestly, 
Because everybody's welcome. And you should never judge a person because of how they look or people with uh, differences, deformities. You know that just when I was at Cambridge I used to, I volunteered to do some, I thought, good work <coughs> for people with Down syndrome. I thought how good I was to spending my time to help others. The food learn. They're helping me <laughs> much more than I ever got from them. Two years, every Thursday afternoon to Fulbright Hospital, I'll go there. I enjoyed it. I must admit, I was more uh, inspired, much more fun, learnt more hanging out with people with Down syndrome than I did uh, hanging out with Nobel Prize laureates. <laughs> Very stupid. <laughs> But I don't know why, but that's just amazing emotional intelligence. I always remember the story when I just broke up with a girlfriend and went into there you know, to the usual Thursday afternoon volunteering. And one of the Down syndrome sort of uh, men just came running up to me and hugged me. And what's wrong? How the hell do you know that? So, please. They sussed it out straight away. And they just, oh, these were where people are highly intelligent. So, no one should be. Everyone has their strengths, their powers. So they don't like to make everyone the same. That would be a terrible world. But in particular, you know, I <coughs> can't change the whole world, but you can change something. So, try to get Andrew Kump up and go. See what happens next. Unfortunately, when that's finished, there'll always be something else. <laughs> one thing at a time. Some way we can serve and help and make a better world. But instead of just saying it, just do things. Make it happen. So anyway, you don't know where it's going to be happening, but one day, maybe you see it just a nice... But actually, you describe what sort of vision you have for a bikuni monastery. Because it should never be men telling the bikunis what they should have. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to be silent most of the retreat and today my voice is going so I might have to continue being silent but yeah I just really want to thank Ajahn Mahal for being here and especially for being here with this project to have a teacher like you is the whole of holy life and it's incredibly empowering I feel like I can do things I would never consider doing on my own <laughs> including this project and the beautiful thing about it is that it hasn't been on my own from the time it started, I was the only person with this uh, vision when I came to England. The vision wasn't very clear. But little by little, as I've been sort of talking about it, and Ajahn Khan has been coming over, people have just started to come on board. And it feels like the monastery is happening from the ground up. You know, it's not happening from having a building and then seeing whether people want it or not. It's more being created by people who are interested. and as it's happening and as we're taking steps together, I can feel a really strong sense of spiritual community evolving. And this is the evidence, you know, what we're seeing now and, and the way we've been practicing together is what this is about. And so far, obviously, we're hiring places to hold these events. But uh, I guess the first uh, part that Anukampa can contribute is something more ongoing that people can come and be part of. So even though it's small, we've just made a really huge step um, a pivotal step by signing a lease for a property in Oxford for five months. So that starts from January. And uh, it's actually the first time that there's been a bhikkhuni presence in England in the history of Buddhism, mm -hmm. or the world as we know it, right? So even though it's a, just a temporary base, <laughs> there have been you know, attempts to do something like this in the past. I think there was a bhikkhuni sangha trust in England, but somehow it, it, uh, it just dissolved. Perhaps there weren't any bikini, because as far as I know, I'm the first English bikini to take the ordination, which is incredible, really. I mean, I've been ordained about 12 years, um, and five years now as a bikini. But it's still a beginning, you know, I'm, I'm still a beginner. Um, but this is just opening things up for other people to be involved, and I hope that everybody can be a part of this. So it's small steps in the beginning, and I think as far as the vision is concerned, it's, it's kind of something that's in evolution, it's being created, you know, as it happens. 
So it could really go in any direction, and we're very open about where the, the bigger monastery will eventually be. But I want it to be a quiet place where people can get that all too precious, res uh, scarce resource of silence and solitude. So I think somewhere rural, and I've got my eyes on Devon because there's quite a lot of supporters there. Um, but it's really up to everybody, you know, where you want this to happen, what you want it to be. So it will be first and foremost a training place for women. But as part of that, obviously, you know, monastics are always dependent on the laity, and the laity give back to us by supporting our practice. So it's a mutual reciprocity. And uh, people will be able to come and stay. The bigger the place, the more people will be able to have. You know, if we have separate accommodation for men, then men can come and stay as well. So it's something for everybody. Um, and we hope that you'll all be a part of it. And there's also opportunities to volunteer. I mean, in this room, when I look around, there are at least probably 40% of people here have been involved in one way or the other with, with the project. And it's so heartwarming to see that and to feel that kind of friendship and support. So there will always be opportunities for other people to get involved too. So you can keep in touch with us, basically. And, uh, yeah. and I wonder if anybody has any questions. Yeah, some feedback. Yeah. <coughs> Noble side is the finish now. Yes. Now we have noble talking. <laughs> I have a space in my room to see yourself and women. Will you be organizing some events, um, like meditation days? Or, um... Yeah, I think in Oxford, I mean, the main thing is that it's a residence for me to be able to put my bags down and actually like sleep in the same bed every night instead of every two or three nights changing. But um, obviously there'll be like meditation every day, and it'll depend on how things go, but I want to open up as much as possible for people to come and join for that. Perhaps once a week we'll have a formal kind of sitting or a uh, dummy discussion, something like this. But it's, it's very much in process, so, but it will be open. In, I think because of the legal situation, we can't make it a fully public place just yet, because that would involve different kinds of insurance. But um, you can write to us and it will be sort of on arrangement that people can come and stay. So there are two rooms, it could even stretch to three if need be. And the rooms are quite big, so we could even have overnight guests, you know, for say a meditation day or something like that. And um, I'm giving teachings at other venues too, so I'm invited by the London Insight Group, Brighton Insight, Hospital Insight, and a few other places this year. So yeah, there'll be things happening that will be some kind of ongoing sense of support for the practice. And day first of all which is feeding me because <laughs> as a bikini I can't cook for myself I can't shop for myself or, or any of that so the first thing is like to come and offer the daily meal but then at a kind of more structural level we need help with organizing events like this so I'm still very very involved in that and it's a lot of admin a lot of time on the internet so I'd really like to be able to kind of get some be better sense of structure um, amongst the volunteer group and um, yeah the trustees as well it's starting to come together, I can really feel that. And it's happening almost quite organically with, with help from various people in this room who've you know, given advice on how to structure things. But I think we probably still need some admin help, especially when the residence starts to operate you know, for things like booking. Um, and all kinds of little things. There's also, yeah, toilet rolls, as your friend says, he's got plenty, and so you know, we don't need them, so I'm like, no, we need them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, don't so always give chocolate. Yeah, chocolate's Because you can't wipe your bum with chocolate, but some of the toilet roll sanitary pads and stuff. <laughs> Basic supplies. <laughs> but also, we still need help on the website, actually, and this is something that has been lacking for the, the last couple of years. Um, because of that, it's not a very active website. I, I think our Facebook page is more active, thanks to our, one of our volunteers. But I'd like the website to become sort of more of a platform for people to come in and check out our news and what's happening at a sort of weekly level. Um, so some help with that would be very much appreciated. Yeah. Perhaps that gives a sense of it. And with these events as well, some more help. Can you do a standing order? Yes. Yes, 
one of our um, trustees is actually here at the back. She's the finance, she's our treasurer. Tehani can put her hand up. And uh, she can help you to, with that. But standing orders are really valuable at the moment, especially now we have like a regular cost, so we have regular rental cost. So standing orders is helpful because then we know kind of how much is coming in. Yeah. So far we've depended on sort of fairly large and anonymous donations that have come sort of out of the blue through our children. <laughs> I've been putting the squeeze on some of my life support. So we do have some funds for the final purpose. It's not really the money that's holding us back, it's more the sense of the community has to be ready for this. Because it, you know, it's going to be apparent, I guess, when I start living in the residence, how much support is actually on the ground. Because like I say, it's, as a monastic, I mean, you're basically depending on people to feed you every day. So, yeah. Hey, Hi, Matt. Thank you so much. I'm um, so happy that I've been in your office. Yeah. What day do you begin? 14th of Jan. 14th of January. And I'm not sure who's going to come over with me because it'd be nice to have someone. But I know a few people in Oxford, Penny's in Oxford. So <laughs> and I have a couple of other friends there who are probably going to take me shopping, put some food in the fridge, and then hopefully come and offer it the next day. So you have so. I think so, yeah, yeah. But it's not exactly clear how I'm getting there yet, so, yeah. Anyone wants to come on the 14th? Sure. <laughs> You're welcome. Is that when we rise and we Yeah, yeah, I'm moving on the 14th. I think I've got a day retreat on the 13th at London Insight, and then after that I'll go to the <coughs> I mean, the reason you haven't seen it is because we only just signed the lease. So and since we signed the lease, I've been organising this and I've been on this retreat. So this is all kind of coming. And like I say, we need help with the website to get it up there and to put the next newsletter out. So the work's kind of non-stop to, you know, start to structure it mentally in my head. Um, I think people coming, uh, the opportunity of coming to a monastery is different from coming to a retreat centre. It's more about collecting the whole of the airport path. So you've got the opportunity not only to develop sati and samadhi, but also to develop the sense of service and the sila, the little acts of kindness in daily life. And it's really about being part of, of a lifestyle. So it won't be a, a straight out and out retreat, but it very much depends really on, on the situation at the time. There may be periods of the year which are quieter, and whoever's coming will have sort of pretty minimal duties. Um, and it'll be structured similarly to other monasteries. So whether, what, the morning is sort of the work period, and then the afternoon is a lot of solitude and opportunity to, to practice formally on the seat. But it, I'm hoping it will be a kind of holistic approach to the practice. Yeah, and I won't always be on the internet, so <laughs> <laughs> some help with admin is also very nice if anybody's staying longer term. Yeah. Yes? Um, it's Central Oxford, but we're not going to publish the address because it's not a public, pro it's like a rental thing. Um, but anybody wanting to come, of course, will get the address and they can apply with us through, um, I think it's a password protected form that will be on the website. So it's very central, it's 30 minutes walk from the station, so I can do some exercise. Mm -hmm. Sorry? No I think there's one space, perhaps. Yeah, for parking. I have to find that in the yeah. But there's, there's easy access with buses as well. For me, it's very important that I can walk there because I can't use money for the bus. So, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, I hope to see some of you there. <laughs> great. And, um, before we do leave, I, I would also like to have a group photo. And if anybody would not like to participate in that, please feel free not to. But anyone who would. <laughs> <laughs> Can I put my hand up? No. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So we will use these photos for our newsletters and uh, the website. So, you know, for later reasons, anybody who doesn't want to participate is free not to. But I think it's very nice. Often, you know, when you capture something in a photo, it can just stir up that beautiful memory and, and remind us of the joy we shared together. So I think it's a really nice thing to do. Um,
Um, so perhaps we could do that now, or, or okay. should we do the um, teddy auction first? Yeah, I'll whichever. And um, the last thing after the photo, in case we all get carried away, is we could really do some help to put these mats back in, I think, Anna's car, but now I'm a little bit confused about that. Are you still taking the mats? Yeah, okay. Yes, okay, fantastic. So, that's right. So, some help with that would be wonderful. So, Teddy Auction? Okay. So, no, no, you can actually. No, I'm not doing the auction. Yeah, okay. I've already got. I've got the thing out here. See what it is. Number one. Exciting. The first is 50 quid. Ooh, what do you reckon? Teddy bear. See if you've got any more. Has put their name on these? Oh, that, that one did, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this one. Oh, that, that's not. That's just another message. Ooh. The next one is 300 pounds. Ooh. Ooh. Very <laughs> well. No. The next one is. Oh, even more. This one is £28,000 from Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry, it's my brother. This is £680. Ooh. Ooh. Is that hard? That's going to be hard to beat. This is £100. Uh, you're going down in price. Is it the last bid which wins it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll see what's the biggest bid and then we can see what happens afterwards. Hey! Wow! Thousand pound! Whoa! Actually, that's got a name on it, it's anonymous. Did you put that on there? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll confess. I'm sure that uh, will be for somebody. A hundred pounds. Alison is winning. Ooh! Anonymous one thousand pound top up. That means you're just going to give, uh, what I'm saying from that is, add a thousand pounds to whatever happens. Ooh. Anonymous thousand pound top up to the highest bid. But what does that actually mean? Does that mean that if it... It means that somebody, pay, the highest bidder gives their part and then they add another. Oh, it's not as if the highest bid... the whole thing. Yeah, in other, in other words, if they bid like five thousand pounds, then no, they bid finished. for six thousand pounds. No, no, the first oh. one the five. Oh, I thought that someone could do a million. It's only the top up. <laughs> the top up. Okay. <laughs> and the last one is... Oh, now this makes it difficult. 100 euros. <laughs> <laughs> so I think 100 euros is the thousand pound is, is the high so far. Okay. <laughs> So that's what we've got so far. Is there any advance on a thousand quid? How do you feel, Teddy Bear? Do you feel that's what you're worth? Are you going to be... Um, it's left in speechless. <laughs> so a thousand pound for the Teddy Bear. Going once. Going tw There's not every teddy bear who sat in the lap of a bhikkhu, a very well-known monk and a very well-known nun. So it's a very, very rare bear. <laughs> and also, the, uh, I think when I last read the newspapers, I think in Wall Street, apparently it's a bear market. Is that correct? <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it must mean that bears are very popular. Is that right? 
What's the difference between a bear market and a bull market? Why don't you know more than me about this? I'm a monk. The market is uh, dependent. <coughs> in other words, everybody's selling. Yeah? The bull market is where everybody's buying. Okay. Well, we're selling. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're selling bears. <laughs> okay. Going. Going. This is your last chance. Because it's very rare that I come to UK. And <laughs> <laughs> it probably is the chance of what happened again. What? Well, it was a bear. Oh. A bear and a hat as well. Ah, mm -hmm. uh -huh, yeah. Going, going. How did that not come? <laughs> Gone for one thousand. <laughs> so, what did it actually say? Oh. It's a bid for Teddy. One thousand. It's in red ink. You know what this one is? It can be anonymous. <laughs> Okay, would you present the bear? <coughs> Give an extra hug. <laughs> Very good. Here, oops, there we go. <laughs> bye bye bear, I'll miss you. <laughs> Very good. So what do we do? Are we doing the... That's it. Oh, photo. Oh, photo. Oh, yeah, photo. Yes. So, who's going to take the photo? I suppose you are. Yeah, can we have... This is not for everyone to take the same photo, because then we'll be here for the next half an hour. So maybe we can have one of our volunteers, because it's often to take the photo. The official photo. How about Darby?